This is a review of pediatric perianesthesia care in December of 2015. This video is for supplemental use in addition to departmental facility approved policies, ARIN guidelines for perioperative practice, ASPAN, and AST guidelines. Objectives. After reviewing this video, staff members will be able to discuss, prepare, and perform interventions based on developmental and physical stages of the pediatric patient, verbalize potential signs and symptoms of child abuse and neglect. Let's begin with neonates. This is age birth to one month. Normal reaction is crying, and what we can do to comfort them is provide them with comfort measures, pacifiers, swaddling, security blankets, try to avoid hunger when possible, warm the room, decrease loud noises and activity. Most facilities do require that a staff member be with the neonate unless a parent is standing by at all levels of care. Infants are age one to 12 months. Their fears are separation from parents, pain, they're distrusting of strangers and unfamiliar surroundings, and loud noises. The usual reaction is crying and some stranger anxiety. To help these patients deal a little better with stress, we can provide them with comfort measures, pacifiers, blankets, woobies, stuffed animals, attempt to avoid hunger, warm the room, try to decrease loud noises and activity, we do want parents to get reunited with children as early as possible, and this is also the type of patient that staff must be at the bedside if the parent isn't at all levels of care. Toddlers are our next population. This is age one to three. This is the autonomy versus shame. They are developing free will, so they fear parental separation and abandonment. Uh, they have a forced dependence and want to do it themselves. Their reactions are usually resistance, potentially aggression, and regression of behaviors related to toileting, eating, temper tantrums, hyperactivity, and unfamiliar environments decrease their coping skills. We can help these kiddos by giving them simple choices, trying to get them involved in the actions of care, touching things, using distractions, singing songs, or talking about familiar characters or cartoons, allowing a security item. These children also must have a staff member or parent with them at all levels of care. We should try to schedule in the morning to avoid hunger, accept regressive behavior and incorporate it into the routine, and avoid the words, go to sleep. Our next group is early childhood and preschool. This is ages three to five. They do feel remorse for their actions. They are magical thinkers. They're curious. They are inquisitive. They fear separation and body mutilation. They are frustrated with unfamiliar surroundings and imagined threats. So our reactions are aggression, uncooperative behaviors, regression, withdrawal, anger, and fantasy. What we can do to help these kiddos out is use stories during their induction. They like colorful band-aids and casting. Allow the children to handle unfamiliar objects to decrease the stress of the situation. You can try puppets. Um, avoid the going to sleep words. Allow security items. And yet again, parents or staff members must be at the bedside at all times with this patient. Um, we do really try to prompt parental you reunion in this situation to help both patient and parents. Middle childhood school age is ages 6 to 12 years old. These children desire recognition for their achievements. Their fears are the unknown, body mutilation, inadequate performances, loss of control and separation, and at this point even death. Reactions are increased verbalizations of fear and feelings of isolation and withdrawal. Inquisitiveness and questioning comes up, and they do have displaced anger and frustration, and at times demanding behavior. To assist these patients, we can provide simple information to decrease the stress, be honest with them at all times, acknowledge their fears, answer their questions, 
Allow them to be involved in simple decisions related to their care. Let them do some hands-on with equipment. At times, music during induction does assist in reducing stress. Provide them with privacy. And do not expect the child to act like an adult. Our next age group is the adolescence to puberty age group at 13 to 18 years old. They have identity versus role diffusion issues. Peer group opinion is very important to them and body image defines their identity. They fear altered body image and disfigurement and not belonging, loss of control, humiliation, and peer pressure. They also do fear death. Our reactions are usually mood swings, depression, helplessness, tough attitude that this can't hurt them, anger, isolation, and stubbornness. We help these patients best by offering information with rationales to decrease their fears. We want to involve them in the planning and decision making with their parents or legal guardians. We do offer to hold hands for support and comfort. Talk directly to this patient, not through the parents, and encourage peer visitation. Pediatric considerations for anatomy and physiology. Pediatric airway anatomy reminders are that birth to four months they are nose breathers so there's a potential for airway compromise by blankets and drapes being over these areas. Tongue is larger proportional to the mouth and loose teeth can easily become dislodged and become foreign bodies. They also have a shorter neck therefore increase the difficult nature of their intubations. Other considerations should include the airway is narrow at the cricoid until age 8. Therefore, the tube might fit at the glottis, but be too tight subglottic, causing post-extubation swelling. Smaller airways can become compromised with even a minor amount of swelling. Smaller and higher larynx with less rigid cartilage support can make the airways more prone to obstruct and spasm and smaller pulmonary function residual capacity. This means that the patient can become hypoxic quickly if an airway is lost. Interventions would be to keep the airway clear of blankets and drapes. When possible, place the child in a sideline position and avoid hyperextension of the neck as the extension itself can cause an obstruction of an airway. We should be assessing the airway frequently after extubation especially after face, head, and neck procedures. Always ask your patient and parents about loose teeth and make anesthesia and recovery aware of them. And assist anesthesia at airway with multiple sizes of pediatric tubes available at times of intubation and of extubation. Specific to airways, what are we going to see and hear in these patients? Normal breathing can have great variation. Infants to four months are nose breathers. Children are belly breathers with rates ranging between 16 and 65 resps per minute. The intervention for these type of patients is usually supplemental oxygen. With anesthesia permission, you can do blow-by oxygen if the nasal cannula prongs are upsetting the child. Abnormal breathing patterns like respiratory depression, can be caused by the anesthetic, narcotics, or hypothermia. They are shallow, slow, or absent respirations, and our interventions should be oxygen, chin lift, potentially an oral airway, even suction, possibly in the nares, and notify your MD at all times, even if in the PACU. Another abnormal breathing pattern would be strider, which can be caused by tracheal irritation and edema, the signs and symptoms are a crowing respiration, and our interventions are humidified oxygen, notifying your MD, and they may order racemic epi. Croup is an additional type of respiratory issue. This would be caused by an intolerance of the intubation or too large of an ET tube or a surgical trauma. The signs and symptoms would be strider, thoracic retractions, hoarseness, and a croup-like barky cough with varying degrees of obstructions. Interventions would be humidified oxygen, notifying your MD and potentially racemic epi, and elevate the head of the bed. Laryngeal spasm is also a potential complication. And it's caused by some type of irritant trigger. 
Our signs and symptoms would be use of accessory muscles and a partial to complete obstruction. And our interventions would be notify MD immediately, get 100% oxygen on them, a removal of the triggering agent, a jaw thrust potentially, some muscle relaxants if ordered by physician, and warming devices. An airway obstruction can be caused by the tongue or soft tissue edema, uh, retained packs like tonsil sponges, or developmental conditions. Now, signs and symptoms of this would be accessory muscle use, nasal flaring, vigorous abdominal and diaphragmatic contractions, and decreased air entry. And our interventions would be suction, uh, getting oxygen on them, notifying the MD, and a chin lift potentially. Equipment that could and should be available in a post-anesthetic, pre-anesthetic, and intra-op area would be small airways, small French suction, small LMAs and ET tubes, a Braslow pediatric emergency tape, potentially a pediatric stethoscope, and small laryngoscope plates. An increased body surface area to weight ratio, thin fat layers, and underdeveloped thermal regulation systems predispose the children to hypothermia. This hypothermia increases oxygen consumption and can in turn result in hypoxemia, metabolic acidosis, and dysrhythmias. Children do have higher metabolic rates, therefore higher oxygen demands, and children under two have immature liver function and slower hepatic clearance. Therefore, they have the decreased ability to concentrate urine. There's an increased fluid replacement per kilogram of body weight that anesthesia needs to account for. Temperature monitoring should occur frequently as overcorrecting can occur rapidly in a small or developmentally delayed pediatric patient. Expose only the areas in which the surgery is being performed and warm the room before the procedure. Heated and humidified air and warmed IV fluids can be used by anesthesia. We will be monitoring the O2 sats very closely and keeping multiple delivery devices available. And due to increased sensitivity to medication and fluid replacement, anesthesia could ask for a bureau chamber for fluids. Signs and symptoms of pain would be crying, irritability, restlessness, guarding in older children, increased vital signs, verbal reports, and we do have the FACES scales available. Interventions would be titration of IV meds, security items like pacifiers, blankets, holding, rocking, swaddling. Familiar faces do assist with some of that anxiety. Our closing discussion points will be related to child abuse. Peri anesthesia staff have a unique situation to assess for presence of signs and symptoms of abuse because the patient will be undressed in the OR. If you suspect abuse, all physicians and clinicians receive training and are able to correctly identify common signs and symptoms of abuse and neglect. At the initial assessment of the child, the physician or the clinician will screen for suspected child abuse or neglect. At most facilities, all cases of suspected child abuse or neglect occurring in a patient will be referred to Child Protective Services of the county where the child lives or to some type of law enforcement agency where the abuse or neglect is suspected to have occurred. Trauma on call social workers provide coverage during non-business hours and should be contacted through your hospital operator. Once a suspicion of abuse or neglect is raised, staff should avoid questioning the child or the parent concerning the situation and should not engage in behavior that would raise a level of anxiety in either the child or the parent. Some clinical manifestations of child abuse would be skin injuries, bites, bruises in many stages of healing, welts on face, neck, chest, back, buttocks, genitals, thighs, traumatic hair loss, external head, facial, and oral injuries, cuts, bleeding, redness of external ear and facial fractures, uh, tears and scarring of the lips, loosened fractured teeth, um, tongue laceration. Other signs may be deliberate or unexplained thermal injuries, immersion burns, multiple small burns, diaper area burns, palms, heels, back, buttocks, shaken baby syndrome, with or without poor feeding, vomiting, lethargy, and retinal hemorrhages, spiral fractures or posterior rib fractures, or sexual abuse may be 
seen as abrasions or bruising on inner thighs and genitals, scars and lacerations, and sexual behavior in pre-sexual age children. Behavioral manifestations of the parents would be explanations are absent or vague, it changes or has conflicting information or is highly unlikely and does not match the clinical picture. There may be depression, uh, preoccupation and limited eye contact, isolation of the family, requesting of staff to agree that the child is difficult to handle, or lack of concern and interest in the child condition or prognosis. Behavior seen in the child may be extremes in behavior and aggressiveness, hostility, withdrawn, shy, frightened of parents or does not expect comfort from them, fearful of other adults, or reports injuries by parents. There may also be signs of destructive or delinquent behaviors, poor self-image, a limitation or loss of functions, nightmares, poor nutrition, and drug or alcohol use. Signs and symptoms of neglect may include failure to thrive, cat and dog bites, feces and dirt in the skin folds, severe diaper rashes with presence of ammonia burns, or inappropriate dress for weather. Patients may tend to be overly submissive to treatment. Um, constant hunger, bags or hoards food, does not expect comfort from the parents, poor hygiene, odor, and seeks affection from any adult.